You've tuned in to Family Church Radio with Pastor Jimmy Scroggins of Family Church. Join us as Pastor Jimmy teaches through the Bible. Jesus' call, when Jesus calls, number one, Jesus' call is number one for all kinds of people. Jesus' call is for all kinds of people. Now we say something like this almost every week and that's because nearly every story and every page in the Bible indicates that God is for everybody. God loves everybody. God created everyone. Jesus came and died on the cross for the sins of the world. God's inviting everyone to have their sins forgiven and to come and to know him. God loves every person and he's inviting everybody into the kingdom of God. The church and scripture are often accused of being exclusive and bigoted. This couldn't be further from the truth. Jesus is for everybody. The most well-known verse for Christians and non-Christians alike is John 3.16. And it summarizes an overarching theme of the Bible as a whole. As Pastor Jimmy will remind us in today's message, God wants everyone to come to Him, regardless of age, race, gender, nationality, ethnicity, or whatever categories they've lumped themselves into. Well, let's join Pastor Jimmy in the book of Luke chapter 5. As he begins his message, Jesus is the one who calls. Today we're going to talk about how Jesus began to call his crew together, his disciples. Jesus was very intentional about who he invited to be his disciples. Jesus had a plan and he had a game plan. And he, had a, he, had a, he had a criteria. He was trying to pull some people in to what he was doing so that they could do their part to build the kingdom of God. One of the things people ask me often is they'll say, Jimmy, how did you get into this? How did you get into preaching and pastoring and ministry? How did you decide to do that? Well, the way that I got into this, I, I grew up, my dad was a football coach. I grew up, I always wanted to be in the army. And so I thought about that and prayed about that and worked towards, I was a Christian kid. And when I got out of high school, I had the chance to go to the United States Military Academy at West Point. And I thought that was going to be my destiny to go to West Point. I would be an army officer. While I was there, I ended up getting cancer. I wasn't able to stay at West Point. I wasn't able to finish there. I did get all the cancer taken care of, so don't worry about that. That was when I was 17, so a long, long time ago. And I ended up going to Jacksonville University, the Harvard of the South, where I... <laughs> what? <laughs> where I studied economics, and I was planning on going to law school. And then while I was there, I was volunteering in my church, working with middle school kids. And while I was volunteering there, they gave me an opportunity to begin teaching the Bible to sixth and seventh grade boys. And I'd never taught the Bible before, and I wasn't very good at it. You might not think I'm good now, but you should have seen me then. And I was learning to teach the Bible, and then they started giving me some more responsibility. And I began to think, you know, I'm watching God change the lives of these young men. And I'm watching God pull their families into the church through the student ministry, and I thought, I actually, I think this would be more fun than being an attorney. Now, no shame on the attorneys that are here, because I'm sure you think that's super fun. But I thought, I, I think this would be great if I could do this the rest of my life. And I went and met with my pastor. And I said, hey, I hear people say they have dreams and visions and God calls them and this and that. I, I, don't, I don't have any of that. Uh, I don't know if I'm being drafted, but I'm definitely willing to volunteer if that's a thing that I can, that I can do. And the pastor said, yeah, you can. If this is something that you want to do, you should pursue it. And so I changed my plans for graduate school. And instead of going to law school, I went to seminary. I got a master's degree on, on uh, theology and Bible. And I learned a lot. And then I ended up staying there and getting a PhD. And God began to, you know, met Chris and we got married. And God began to pull us into all of this ministry. And here we are, Chris, and 30 years later, still by God's grace doing the same thing. And I'm so thankful for the calling that God placed on our lives. But what I'm afraid of is that some people come to a church like ours and they think there's only two real callings. You can be called to be a pastor or a minister. You can be called to go to Africa somewhere and be a missionary. Or the rest of y'all are just basic peon Christians. That's all you got, right? You got the pastors, the missionaries, and the basic peon Christians. That's not true. I want you to know that there is no exaltation. There's no special status attached to someone who full-time serves in vocational ministry, whether here or overseas. There's no special gold stars for that. That is not a special category.
category of people. They are just men and women called by God, serving God, the way that God has called them to serve. But you have to serve the way that God has called you to serve to, and your calling before God is equal to anyone else's if you're pursuing it and saying yes to God. So you shouldn't feel that way. You say, wow, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. The issue is not what God is calling you to do. The real issue is surrender. Are you willing to do whatever it is that God is asking of you? Because God wants to use you, but you have to say yes. God loves you and he wants to use you, but you have to say yes. If you're a Christian, then your answer to God has to always be yes. He's given his son for you on the cross. He's died on the cross for your sins. God raised him from the dead. You can't hold anything back from God if you're gonna serve God. Your answer to God must B, yes. And today we're going to see four men that Jesus called. All four, four of them chose to put their yes on the table for Jesus. And so here's how it happened. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. This is the word of God. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, this is Jesus, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. That's another name for the Sea of Galilee. We talked about that last week. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and by the way, Simon is another name for St. Peter. Simon Peter is the same guy. Gets into the boat, which was Simon's, or Peter's, and he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Let's keep going. Skip down to verse 27. We're skipping some pretty amazing healing stories. Don't worry, we're coming back to that. Verse 27. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. Pause right there. This guy, Levi, is also known as Matthew. He's the author of the gospel of Matthew. And you're like, well, what's up with all these guys having more than one name? I don't know. You just have to pick up on it as you study the Bible. It's weird. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why? Do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And this is the word of the Lord and all God's people said, Amen. amen. So Jesus is walking. He's got this episode. He's calls Peter and James and John. They become his disciples. They leave everything that day to come and follow him. He goes and gets Matthew or Levi out of his job as a Roman IRS agent. And he calls him right out of his office and he gets up and he leaves everything and follows Jesus immediately. This is an incredible story where Jesus is calling these four guys who became pretty famous in the kingdom of God. I mean, you go around the world, there's a lot of stuff named after Matthew and James and John and Peter. I mean, these guys are famous. They all wrote books of the Bible. I mean, these guys are Big time. These are not lightweights. And Jesus calls them. And one day they leave what else they're doing and they go and they follow Jesus. Now, I have a thought about this. And if you've been studying the Bible for a while, if you've been to church growing up, you always hear these stories of Jesus as these uh, independent vignettes. And it's hard to pull it all together. But the way that St. Luke writes this story, 
it kind of makes me wonder if Jesus already knew Peter and James and John from before. I mean, the truth is they'd all kind of grown up around there. It's possible that they knew each other growing up. Maybe they played against each other in uh, Little League. Maybe they uh, went to school across town from each other. Maybe their moms were in a coffee group together. I don't know. But it's possible that these guys knew each other. And the reason I say that, if you think back, and you don't have to look it up here, so you can. If you turn back a chapter in Luke chapter 4, Jesus teaches in the synagogue, and after they have church on Saturday, Jewish church on Saturday, they teach the synagogue, he goes to Peter's house. So before this story happens, Jesus has already been hanging out in Peter's house. He's already eaten in Peter's house. And when he was at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law got sick, and Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. And then after he healed the mother-in-law, all these people from their town came over to Peter's house and Jesus had this massive healing service at Peter's house before this happened. That's why when Jesus goes down to the lake and says, I think I want to teach from a boat, he looks at Peter and says, how about your boat? He's okay. So he gets in Peter's boat and then he's teaching from Peter's boat. He says, now I want to tell you to go fishing. Peter was a professional fisherman. Jesus was not. Why would he take Jesus' advice? Well, after he had that big healing service in his living room yesterday, I'll do whatever you want. I mean, this guy, no telling what this guy can do. So it's possible and likely that he already had a relationship with Peter and James and John before they leave their nets and follow him. This message you're hearing is just one from Pastor Jimmy Scroggins of Family Church in South Florida. If you're interested in learning more, head over to gofamilychurch.org. If you look for us on Instagram, you'll find us by typing at gofamilychurch. Pastor Jimmy has more to share with you in today's message, so don't go anywhere. We're so glad you tuned in today to discover and pursue God's design for your life right here on Family Church Radio. Then they have this other episode where Jesus goes to the tax collector's booth. Now, the way the tax collectors worked, many of you already know this, but these tax collectors were Jewish people who had walked away. They were seen as, as almost like turncoats. They were, they were seen as a betrayal. These guys had betrayed their own culture, their own people, and they were working for the Roman government, and they were authorized to collect taxes. And these guys got wealthy because what they would do, instead of collecting the correct amount, They made their living by collecting the correct amount, which they had to turn over to the government, but then collecting extra for themselves. And if they did that, the Roman soldiers would enforce whatever tax rate they wanted to apply. And so they were hated. They were despised. They were not considered real Jews anymore. They they would not uh, be allowed into worship anymore. No one would associate with them. These guys were repulsive guys. Well, Jesus goes and goes to this guy named Levi, Matthew, and calls him out of the tax collector's booth. Now, I only have one interesting thing If you go back and look in Luke chapter three, John the Baptist is out there baptizing a bunch of people. He calls it a baptism of repentance. It is people who are turning from their sins and turning back to God. As he baptizes people in this baptism of repentance, Jesus comes out there, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. He says, hey, uh, I can't baptize you. You're the son of God. And Jesus says, you're gonna baptize me because I'm identifying with sinners. And so John the Baptist baptizes him. But it also says that when Jesus is out there getting baptized, John the Baptist, John the Baptist is baptizing. It specifically says tax collectors come out there to get baptized. And John the Baptist tells him, if you're going to get baptized, a baptism of repentance, you've got to quit overcharging everybody. Don't get baptized in a sign of repentance if you're going to keep overcharging everybody. So all these tax collectors get baptized by John the Baptist and they repent. It kind of makes me wonder if possibly that's some foreshadowing by Luke And maybe Luke is saying, maybe Matthew and Jesus got baptized out there on the same day by John the Baptist. Maybe they were baptized together on the same day. And now when Jesus shows up and Jesus says, hey, I think it's time. You know, you're not even making a lot of money at this anymore now that you started doing it honestly. Why don't you leave this stupid career and why don't you come and follow me? Matthew does it. But here's what we can learn. Jesus' call, when Jesus calls, number one, Jesus' call is, number one, for all kinds of people. Jesus' call is for all kinds of people. Now, we say something like this almost every week, and that's because nearly every story and every page in the Bible indicates that God is for everybody. God loves everybody. God created everyone. Jesus came and died on the cross for the sins of the world. God's inviting everyone to have their sins forgiven and to come and to know him. God loves every person. 
And he's inviting everybody into the kingdom of God. You say, well, where's that in the text? Okay, if you have your Bible still open, you've got to be looking at your Bible. I don't know this will work. But uh, verse 1, it says Jesus is talking to the crowds. So just start there. Everybody. He's not being uh, discriminate. He is talking to anybody who wants to show up. Jesus wants to invite anybody who wants to show up. That's who Jesus wants. And by the way, that's who we want at Family Church too, isn't it? We want anybody who will show up. We want anybody to come in the doors, who will walk in the doors. We want anybody. We don't care the color of their skin. We don't care how much money they make. We don't care where their citizenship lies. We don't care what their accent sounds like. I don't care what their pronouns are in their bio. I don't care anything about any of that. Anybody who wants to come hear the message of Jesus Christ, God wants them to hear it, and we want them to hear it. And that's the story. So listen, we should not be a church of just pushing people out. When people think of family church, they should not think, I would not be welcome in a church like that. Everybody's welcome in a church like this. Everybody's welcome and wanted. Also, if you look down at verse three, what happens? Now he's talking to fishermen. Chapter five, verse three. Jesus is talking to fishermen. He's borrowing Peter's boat. He's pulling James and John into the conversation. Skip down to verse 27. Now he's talking to Levi, a tax collector. Now he's down at the tax, tax collector's office. And then verse 29. Now he's at a party full of tax collectors. Jesus is for everybody. Keep going to verse 30. Now he's dealing with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the religious leaders. It, Jesus is dealing with them. It doesn't matter. Jesus deals with people from every walk of life, Jesus deals with people from every level of religious religiosity. Jesus is there for everybody. Now, we live in a big world. I think there's almost 8 billion people alive on this planet right now. 8 billion people. And Jesus is inviting every one of them to come and be a part of his kingdom. Well, how does Jesus do that? He does it through us. That's why if we don't go, everybody shouldn't go be a missionary, but some people should. And if God's calling you to that or God's calling your kids to that or your grandkids to that, you should not be in the way of that. You should be cheering for that because how else is God going to invite 8 billion people to come and know him? Let me tell you, the statistics are staggering when you think about it. 8 billion people, but 3.2 billion people have never heard of Christ. 3.2 billion people on this planet do not know about Jesus. There's over 7,000 groups of people, identifiable groups, whether that's a linguistic group or a national group or a tribal group. Seven, over 7,000 groups of people are unreached with the gospel. They don't have the gospel. Two out of five people in the world have never even heard of Jesus Christ. You start looking at the statistics and you start thinking, somebody does need to go be a missionary. And that's why it's so important when you give to Relentless Pursuit. Part of what you give to is we help fund thousands of missionaries all over the world. Why? Because there are billions of people who've never heard of Jesus Christ, and it's our job to tell them. Jesus is for everybody. You say, yeah, I don't get fired up about that because I came from another country. I'm glad to be here. I don't really worry about, okay, okay. I don't agree with you on that. I think you should be worried about everybody because Jesus is, but let's just talk about South Florida then. Let's just talk about South Florida. Some researchers estimate that 70% of people in South Florida don't understand the gospel. I mean, they may have heard something about Jesus or they may have been to a church or been to a funeral or done something, but over 70% of the people in South Florida don't understand the gospel, that Jesus was crucified for their sins, raised from the dead. He's inviting them to have their sins forgiven and their lives changed. Who is going to tell those people? That's what we are for. And that's why one of our strategies that we have at Family Church, what are we doing? We're trying to put 100 churches in South Florida that'll preach the gospel, 100 neighborhood churches, neighborhood pastor, neighborhood building, neighborhood church, speak the neighborhood language, put in a neighborhood school. We wanna reach as many people as we can. Our hope is that if we multiply these neighborhood schools, which we are going to do, we're gonna have 5,000 students in our neighborhood schools across multiple counties in South Florida. We're doing that not just to pat ourselves on the back, not because we're trying to expand market share or something like that. We're doing it because Jesus is for everybody. That's what it's about. Number two, Jesus' call is for those who recognize their brokenness. Jesus' call is for those who recognize their brokenness. You see what happened with St. Peter? St. Peter's out there in the boat. I mean, this guy, I already had the big healing service at his house a few days ago. Now Jesus is in the boat and Jesus says, all right, um, you've heard me teach at the synagogue. You've seen me heal people in your living room. Now I want to show you where to fish. And Peter kind of starts telling Jesus, because if you read through the, the gospels, Peter often tries to boss Jesus around, right? I mean, that's just one of the things that he does. Some of you do that too. 
And St. Peter, Jesus is like, hey, I want you to, I want you to go out there deeper. And St. Peter's like, look, Jesus, you're not a professional fisherman. I am. Let me tell you how this goes. We fish at night. You don't fish during the day. It's too hot. You can't catch fish during the day. We just fished all night. Now it's day. We're not going out there. And Jesus says, well, I want you to push out deeper. You don't fish deeper with these nets, Jesus. Jesus, this is shallow. You, you fish in the shallows with these nets. You don't do it in the day and you don't do it deep. And Jesus says, will you just, did you see what I did in your living room? Will you just, will you just, I wonder if Jesus is saying that to me sometimes, don't you? You've seen everything I've done for you. You've seen everything I've done in this world. You've seen everything I've done in history. And I'm just asking you to do this one thing. Will you just? Peter does it. And lo and behold, they catch all this fish. So much fish. They catch all this fish. They have to get the other boat out there. They're filling up their boat. To, to the point that Peter finally is so overwhelmed by the number of fish that are caught. And this is a professional fisherman. You think he would say, dude, Come back out tomorrow. We're going to make a bunch of money. If I have you as my fishing buddy, this is the best. This is the best thing I've ever seen. No, Peter, it, for whatever reason, this gets Peter, and Peter realizes this isn't about fish. This is about somebody who controls the fish. This isn't just a guy. This guy can control demons. This guy can control disease. He can even control fish. And Peter just realizes this is something different. This is something new. And he gets down on his knees and in Luke chapter five, verse eight, St. Peter says, you gotta get away from me. I'm too sinful. I know myself and I'm seeing who you are. I'm too sinful to be around you. Kind of reminds me of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. In the Old Testament, there's this prophet named Isaiah. He lived about 700 years before Jesus. And Isaiah sees a vision of God high and lifted up. And Isaiah is so moved by the righteousness and the majesty and the holiness of God the holiness of God causes Isaiah to see his own sinfulness. It's like a contrast. God is so perfect. He sees his own imperfections spotlighted by the holiness and perfection of God. And so Isaiah says, he writes about this vision. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell amidst the people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts kind of like what Peter was experiencing right I, I realized I'm seeing the king the lord of hosts he, he's the lord of the demons he's the lord of the diseases he's the lord of the fish in the sea and I'm recognizing who he is and when I see who he is I realize who I am I'm not worthy to be with this guy and he gets down on his knees and he just starts worshiping him he says you got to get away from me same thing Isaiah did Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of unclean lips. I'm not worthy. But in the vision that Isaiah has in Isaiah 6, God has mercy on Isaiah and God cleanses Isaiah from his sin. He, he takes away his sin. He atones for his sin. And then after that, Isaiah says, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, Isaiah says, it says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. We're so grateful you decided to tune in to Family Church Radio with Pastor Jimmy Scroggins today. Family Church Radio's home is Family Church, located in South Florida. We're a multicultural and multi-generational group of people striving to do life well in the name of Jesus. We want you to know that you're loved by Jesus, saved by His grace, and you matter to us. Do you know God's design and purpose for your life? If your answer is no, we welcome the opportunity to help you discover what that means for you. Will you take a step of faith and connect with us? You can visit our website, gofamilychurch.org. If this message has come just at the right time to speak life into your situation, know that Jesus is the one. God has revealed that to us through His Word and through the Gospel of Luke. Luke compiled evidence that supported the teaching and the miracles of Jesus, especially the birth of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. Luke uses the evidence and the eyewitness testimony to construct a narrative, and he presents Jesus to us as believers to help us be more confident in our faith. Luke set out to make a case for Jesus, and in this series, we're going to see how Jesus is the one. We invite you to gofamilychurch.org radio 
to hear other messages like this. Pastor Jimmy Scroggins is the pastor of Family Church, located in three South Florida counties. Did you know we're a multicultural and multi-generational church dedicated to helping you discover God's purpose and design for your life? We want to walk alongside you as you pursue God's plan for your life. In fact, won't you go to our website now to plan your visit with us? On GoFamilyChurch.org, you'll see a Plan Your Visit link to get started. Just fill out the form so someone from Family Church can get in contact with you and help you connect to God and others at Family Church. If you're not in the South Florida area, we encourage you to connect with us through Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. Just type in at Go Family Church. Before we go, we want to express our gratitude to all of our listeners for your support and prayers throughout the years. We trust you'll be back again for another teaching with Pastor Jimmy on Family Church Radio.